the second speaker is Professor Old Sen. Let's welcome Professor Sen. Can you hear me? Okay, back there. Okay. Professor Wang gave a very, very strong talk in the diversity of languages. Where he come from? How can we trace it back in time and then in space? All these questions can in a, in a sense, in a sense, be come, come back to us and ask the questions. Where are we come from? What are we? Those questions are in the past. The important question now is, are we different? <clears throat> are we different in a sense? If you read Professor Wang's introductory, a paper he gave in the inauguration ceremony of this joint center, you will find out. He wrote an article called, Who is Chinese? Say it's Zhongguo It's a very interesting question. In a sense, if you look at long time ago, 20,000, 2,000 years ago in China, 1,500 years ago in China, you want to see people from different stripes. And they are living together, different ethnicity, and so on. A while ago, this morning, I visited Chengsi Dashi. I went to Chengsi Dashi for one purpose this morning. I want to look at their beautiful digital archive that they try to help make display of Dunhuang. You know, nowadays, if we walk into the cave in Dunhuang, Usually, they will give you turn on the light a little bit, or you take a torch. Do you see anything? Yeah, some pictures on the wall. Some of them are fading away. But nowadays, because of they digitize in three dimensions the whole cave, just one, two or two, two or two, only one of them, you will see the tremendous treasure of the painting, the person, the dancer, the singer with all this uh, instrument in those days. And those people you look at, the dancers, they came from different stripes, with different hairstyle, eye. You cannot see it, except now because it's digitized and preserved. And now, with the modern technique, Scientific technique, you can high tech tech, you can have the pictures really showing in front of you. Even you can see among these dancers, there are a group of uh, instruments. You usually don't see them. You go there and look, look at all the big wooders, look at the coke, look at all these uh, big paintings. You don't need, you never pay attention to this small object, because you don't see it, you didn't see it. But now, because of this, this opportunity, you can see it, they give you a tremendous power of civilization during these days. Back to Professor Wang's paper. If you describe who's Chinese in those years, apparently it's a very difficult definition to be Chinese. Professor in that paper also mentioned a very, very interesting story that he went to Dayao San, Dayao Mountain, in the southern part of China, in the jungle, where Fei Xiaotong, the all very uh, famous late uh, sociologist, anthropologist, 
He tried to look up around that area. He described. In fact, he was trapped. And then when he was trapped, he couldn't get out of it. And with the flood, big raining come over. His wife had to go out to look for help. But then, because of the flood, his wife passed away, died. Later on, he was saved. He write about that area, described by the people. And when Bill on, went back to that village 60 years after, look at the same place. The people didn't change. The same costume, the same language, the same everything. In other words, time stood still for 60 years, maybe longer. Maybe time stood for the enough for that place, hundreds of years. Now, when Bill Wong showed them a camera, a digital camera, with that digital camera, and they look at it, look at their own pictures. You can see their face and their expressions. Oh my God, how can you take my spirits in onto that day? That little plastic. You think about it. These people do not have that kind of high tech mentality like ours. And so we are asking the questions. Are we the same? Are we the same human in the sense of the cognitive ability? When Darwin said, the descent of man, we're talking about human as a whole species that you're holding with uh, people compared with uh, where our cognitive function come from compared with the continuity from all the different species. We're different in terms of maybe the degree of sophistication. But now we're asking among our people in the contemporary time, are we different from those people in South Sahara Desert? We are different in terms of certain objective measurement. First of all, let's take a look how long they live. Our life expectancy, you and I, I'm going to be hoping I'm going to be able to live to 90 years old. I hope. For you, you should expect yourself to live at least 100 years. Okay? At least. Because from now till you are 90, you are going to have better medical care, better everything, transportation better education, better knowledge. So, your ability to solve new problems will be much better. So we expect your life to extend it to at least 100 years. But you look at those places, maybe Daiyosan, you can also, you can right now, predict their average life expectancy is not going to over 55. In the UNESCO's record two years ago, people who live in southern part of Sahara Desert, you know how long they live? Their life expectancy is 40 years old. In other words, in terms of life, living biologically, we are twice power, more rich, whatever. You think about it. In that sense, we are different biologically. We have biological life 
expectancy. But are we different in our cognition? How we represent the world? As Bill Wong just said, we represent the world by language. So we really need to examine how the brain changed the language. Yes. Because we have certain kinds of brain, the pre, pre, pre position, position, dispositional. And so we have this way of language. And because the language keep evolve, change, the turn around to save our brain too. And so in that sense, we are in a very exciting era and we are looking at how do we understand human behavior. Now, let's... Can I have that? Uh, oh, here's this one. This is forward. Okay. How to understand human behavior? With those very complicated way of everybody move in different ways, the different society. We used to say, do we have a general law? General law in the sense of monothetic approach, we assume all of us are the same. So we are looking for the principle of learning, the principle of memory, the principle of making decisions, the principle of doing, carrying out our behavior in the same way. If the law is to remain the same, and that's the way we try to look for it. That's one way of scientific approach. The other one is we are looking for a kind of ideographic approach. We begin to look at, well, given the same situation, people do not respond in the same way. We don't move in a whole group. Maybe we should look individually. And then try to come up with these variations. Why we have those variations? Think about it. This is two approach. One, emphasize the average of behavior because we treat everybody in the same way. So we're looking for the average. The other one, average. It's important, but not that essential. We have to look for variations. Why people are different. So we have to account, to take into account the variance of behavior. You think about this. I want you to really carefully think about this. When we talk about democracy, is democracy average? You take it a mean, or democracy is a mode. How many people? More people is a mode. They all represent a central tendency, mathematically. But they have different concepts. Democracy should be more like a mode, and not an average. If you think about this way, but the way we should look at behavior. In fact, nowadays, I'm going to show you you have to take close approach. Looking for the general law, yeah, at a certain level. But we have to account for variance in its more global sense. Okay? So we have two ways to look at it. We all based upon hypothetical deductive research. We make something and then come up and say, hmm, I think behind this different phenomena, there is a general rule. And then based upon this general rule, I can then generate and under this rule, if we encounter another situation, this rule, this law, is going to tell me it's going to behave a certain way. And that's a pure logic. So we have hypothesis. Then based upon the hypothesis, you generate predictions. And then researcher try to verify your result. Refute it, modify it, 
but don't compare your result and your prediction. That's the general way of doing scientific investigation. To combine all what I'm saying, variance, and then to combine that with uh, average, mean, what does what it tell, tell us is we have to look for probability. One time I was called by, in California, by a judge, asked me to be the eyewitness for a criminal case. I went up there. He asked me and said, you psychologist, you study memory. Tell me, this, this witness said he, or this criminal said he, in under that situation. This is the criminal, right? And then I said, probably, but I'm not sure. So this, this judge tell me, you are a scientist. Just tell me yes or no. And I said, I can only give you probability. I cannot give you a definite answer. And he said, that's not science. I told him, that's exactly is the most important part of human science. Because we don't behave in exactly the same way under the certain situation. But the problem to understanding this whole phenomena then we have to account for why, where the variance come from. Okay, now let's take a look. Okay. When we open our eye, you see? The understanding of of your environment. It's just your eye. What are your eye doing? Your eyeball. That's a pupil. All the lights come in and then hit the nerve system in the retina. Okay? Immediately, you notice one important aspect of your vision. What? Well, if I walk closer to Professor Wang, in his eyeball, in the back, the retina of me, the image of me, become bigger and bigger. When I go away, it becomes smaller and smaller. Do I change? No. But the eye, the, the retina, exactly stimulus that hit the, the response, and the response by objective calculation. You are actually bigger. But our brain says, no, it's not bigger. It's actually the same. When do you learn this? You learn it when you are very young. During this, your infant stage, your father, your mother, your caretaker, give you milk, a bottle of milk. You cannot just tell the milk and then give it to your eye and say, this is more milk. Okay? And tell us, not much milk. <laughs> you have all the big milk. The kids learn. They the same milk. Same amount of milk. So you can see the important thing about stimulus. Yes? When we have the input, into the central organism. The important thing is to see what is the proximal stimulus. The retina <coughs> is the proximal stimulus. It changes all the time. The distance, the remote the distance that I'm moving closer, farther away, I'm the same. In the distal stimulus, the same. And we have to account for that kind of variations from very young, any behavior. 
And this is the student side. So we call, if you want to learn to study behavior probabilistically, then you have to account for two things. One is the proximal stimulus. The other one is the proximal stimulus. The same object. Okay? You're asking questions in different way. How it happened in the retina? A response, response immediate. And how do we make a response? The other distal question is to ask why Zhao Wuzu, why God built it this way? Evolution, of course. And how evolution in the background, in history, met this, that particular system, plasma system, that way. Okay? So you're asking a question in this important two principles. One is the plasma, the other one is distal. So when we talk about causation, causal effect, we talk about plasma causation in the sense of how. We talk about distal causation in the sense of why. Okay? So that's the way biology tells us, teach us how to think about way in a scientific way. Okay? But we all know I is only one example. There are I to the brain. And then we also have to make response. The same stimulus, same causation do not always come up with the same response. I have to make sure if I hit go back, what is the consequence of that kind of response? I have a decision making. I have a choice. I have a lot of cultural consideration. So I have immediate response to hit back. But, oh, no, I have a lot of social, cultural, distal consideration that I shouldn't do it. And in the long run, in balance, that balance that I don't hit or I hit is your personality. So you think about it, which one lens, this is called the lens model that we have input, output, and taken into account distal and proximal simultaneously. But that's not enough. As I said, this is a roughly original lens model clearly the detail how that affect using lens as a metaphor and then stimulus has a consequence stimulus itself also has a consequence that when we encounter things stimulus become a cue and for that cue because of my past history or others history or I read about it so everything that that cue has a certain causal effect to, in the future, I shouldn't do it, or imply a certain choice already. So a single lens model give you here, precisely, I have to know what cause what. How many degree of angles cause you to do your behavior certain different. I have to calculate it. We use statistical procedure called analysis of variance, okay? That's the way physics conduct their science. That's the way chemistry in their field, chem chemists doing their, their science. But psychologists, oh, we, if we try to understand behavior biologically, then you have to have correlation. The correlation of this to here in the future. 
Okay? It's very simple. But because it's too simple, we said this is not enough. Because the world is more complicated than this. So, we begin to see so many things happening in cognitive psychology. First of all, we begin to emerge a concept code. code. The first one that changed from behaviorist stimulus response to become coding approach is problem. There are many people, but he's a representative. Robin. Robin was in during the war, first World War, and then Second World War. They all conduct research for the Air Force. He is trying to say to, to pit, do the experiment to find out. When the stimulus come in, do I pay attention to all of them? Right now, I look at you. Do I have everybody movement here, there? Do I take all the information in? Of course I cannot do that. I have something called limited capacity. On one instance of viewing, I cannot take everything. But I can ask you to report. How many do you see? And also, for those things that I pay attention to, I orient myself to this, this way. How, but I'm still seeing someone here. He still moves. He's moving. Her hand, up and down. Does that information register into my mind? Robin asked a question like this. So we quickly use dichotic, dichotic kind of experiment. They find out when you shadow one channel of information and leave the other channel going on, but you have to pay attention to this one. The other ear, another signal coming in. You find out you don't take up everything. You cannot report everything from the other ear. You only can report from this attention shadow channel. The question is, do you really not pay attention to this? Then a student came in, young student called Anne Trisman. Before she graduated from her undergraduate study, she performed a series of experiments. That series of experiments begin to show up, tell you, you should pay attention to this channel only. And then if I embed it, you pay attention to this, listen to people, and then suddenly they are your name, your own name, being inserted in the other channel that you're not supposed to pay attention to. You find out, you do notice them. Your own name, because that's biologically important. For example, the other example would be, if we say fire, the room is on fire. You pay attention to this channel, but the other says fire, you jump out. Meaning that you do take those information in, you just don't do further analysis. Because of that, we know information has to be coming out and to be represented in a certain way, semantically, phonologically, physically, pitch high and, and low, and all this information. Lieberman at Haskin Laboratory, he began to experiment. I don't have time to do, talk about all of them to give you some introductory very short note. He find out by a consonant and vowel, especially the stop consonant, physically represented in a certain way, not that important. 
and uh, people are pay attention to where the information come from. I think I should perform an experiment here. I will take two, two, two time, two short time. Tell you what. When I was in Taiwan, I usually ask my student, class student, up and said, "Build yourself one, two, three, four, five, six. So I asked my student, "How do you say in Ch Taiwanese?" Minan. And they were said, "Chit, neng, sa, si, go, la, chit, pe, gao, zha." So I asked them. Okay, tell me, la, liu, la, do you hear a K? Do you hear a K in the back of your spoken out sound? Many Taiwanese students sit there and say, huh? No, la, no K. So I said, okay, now let us see. When you say English, now let's say good. Good luck. You said Taiwanese, go luck. I said, luck. Do you hear a K? Good luck. Everybody say, yeah. Luck, a K. Huh? Then the, the Taiwanese go luck. Exactly the same luck. Why do you hear one K and the other one you don't hear it? The coding system is different. Okay? So I give you a good example. So I another follow the experiment. I said, now tell me. Liu ge. Liu ge. In Taiwanese. You, you know, Google, I said two. Two. Then ge. Taiwanese will say, Neng e, e is a shirt. Neng e. Because if I say, Liu ge, they will use Taiwanese to say, Lak ye. Lak ye. Lak ye. Lak ye. Lak ye. Lak ye. I say, You how do you make ye become the teeth of the teeth? Lak ye. So you immediately, you have evidence to show you do have something in the back of that. Because that can give you yeah. So you can do experiments and you can perform and then let people understand the idea of code. Now, followed by spelling. For those people who are in psychology, you know spelling give you Three string roll of numbers, and then ask you to take a look, and then shut off, and then ask you to report. You can only report about seven. But if you said no, 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 don't do the whole report, but sampling, I said, report only the first line, report only the third, second line, report only the third line, then you will find out. Sampling, then come back to this average. They will give you about 12. Seven and 12, there's a big difference. What happened? Partial report tell you the real story. You actually see more than you can report. So that's spoiling. Of course, they are also discovered the kind of a Masking effect. I won't get into that. George Miller began to talk about chunking. Chunking, chunking, chunking. Put things together, and the language give us the best example of this chunking. Okay? So, IBM become one chunk now. But people who never encountered IBM, that will be three units. Okay? Give me one example. The very ex excellent experiment. If you ask people to say the following two lines of letters, do they all started with the B, B, monitoring B, the first 
first letter is B. So you show them B L O C K. The next one is B L O C K. Exactly the same. You will find out student or subject take longer than when you scramble P B O L K C. They scram they scramble them. In other words, we chunk them into a unit. It is difficult for you to see. B out of a unit, even they are all in the same, the first letters in a row. And because of that, we have this coding idea. When I, in the 70s, the 80s, I show, we have a template code. Now, when we give you a series of letters, words, you are able to know which one comes with first, which one comes with second, or later, we call recency judgment, or primacy judgment. You are doing very well. And then when you put into a organized words, categorized words, you perform even better. In that experiment, demonstrate, we have automatic temporal coding, we have organized temporal coding because you're doing the rehearsal. Okay? I won't get into that, but just to give you their code, temporal code. The endotoving then talk about two different kinds of memory. So memory, we have two different episodic memory, symmetric memory, and so on. Paul Kohler is the one, I think one day, he died already, passed away already. But his research is going to be very important for all of us to think about. His student, Rodiger, are now the top of the memory researcher. They talk about the call. Memory is a procedure of brain or neuron. Analyze that stimulus in exactly the same way, using the same kind of neural processor. That will ring the bell. Okay? So you have very different, interesting kind of a idea of memory. The important point is this. He asked subject to read every sentence or the textbook reverse, in a reverse way. So you, it's difficult. If every letter in the text being reversed, it's very difficult. But you learn to do it, and then you become very expert. Reading inverse letters or mirror writing letters, you, you can do it. The important thing is, after two or three years later, he called the people back. They don't remember. They ever did this kind of experiment before. That's a long time ago. But when he showed them inverse reading, again, the benefits of time, because of they have, in the past, they have done this procedural training. They have done much, much better than a novice who never had that training before. In other words, that kind of procedure. That will give you a hint, all of you. I ask you to read this month, National, National Geography. The whole issue dedicated about one, one third to brain research. Okay? In that brain research paper article, they talk about the experiment in UCLA. What they did, they are able to show subject by looking at movie actress, a very famous one. I don't remember her name. Jennifer, Jennifer. Aniston. Jennifer Aniston. They trip by training. Later on, they have they find out with functional imaging, the only single place is single place. In other words, we become only one place down to the third neuron that representing her face pictures. Well, I mean, it's close, but whatever. You can pick it up. 
So it's so fascinating. How do we connect brain to all these different cognitive and language issues? For call procedural learning is a special code. Psycholinguistic, we have free structure code that you, you know, talk about branching or whatever language, subject, verb, verb phrase, subject phrase, and then you know this grammar, schema, cognitive psychology talk about all these different codes. This all become abstraction and become very complicated. Now, next. You see? Oh. I just want to show you. Okay. So you can understand behavior from the perspective of structural biology. Why we want to use this course to talk about biology? Because it's my bias. That's the only way to understand human behavior. If you don't know about biology, you cannot really understand human behavior. It's in its ultimate sense. We have, in the era of genetic, everybody, when I was young, we read about gene, we have no idea what this gene is. We just said, well, they are genetic, that have different people have in different heritage. We never, we never saw a gene. And in 1953, the Nobel laureate, they discovered double helix. 53, 1953. Later on, they find out all this P and Q and different chromosome, and all the gene can actually be taken away. They discover all the jumping gene, and then you are able to knock in, knock out all this gene into the animal model, or maybe to the human. We suddenly have the opportunity to look at the genetic maneuver we call genetic engineering. Then later on, people begin to look at how can we sequencing, really sequencing out by every human genomic. And so, 50 years later, 2003, the human gene genetic map will complete. It's complete, okay? So, everyone, I was uh, president of the National Young University, and my university had a chance to decoding or the sequencing of chromosome 4. And we don't have money. The researcher had money come over to me. Then I said, I'll get money for you. I have no idea where the money will come from. But then I asked a VA hospital to give me the money. And then we solve with sequence number four. Why? Because we have all the data about hepatitis in China, in Taiwan. So we are able to get all this uh, gene sequence. Then we begin to go from genomic to functional genomic. We begin to see what is all every genomic is you is doing. There are certain genes who have to control. Certain genes waiting to be spread their power. And there are others waiting to do other things. And these days we are talking about dark gene. That we have no idea or garbage gene. We don't know why they are there. But more and more studies find out the garbage gene to be more important than the gene we know because they're actually the commander. So we have, because of this gene, help to have protein synthesis in the proteomics era. Then, now, it's more complicated than genomic sequencing. It's epigenomic. Moving us closer to behavior, but it's very difficult to do that further genomic sequencing. But everybody is trying that, uh, are doing that now, because that's a lot of money involved in terms of medicine, drug. But here, if we look at the cell, then we have 
grows, the cell will grow and then branching. The cell will make functional connectivity connections. That's important. Then, for all these connections, we have exactly function and conditions. We have attention, memory, decision making, and abstractions. Those are important cognitive functions. And you can see they all based upon these cell neurons connections. Okay? That's all the stories. Make a very human, complex stories that we need to really decipher. So, take a populistic functionalism. My colleague, when I was in California, Lou Petrovich, come up with this very unique pictures, okay? He extended one lens model I just talked about. Then he put a response to another acting side, another lens model. And all this had to be kept coordinated. So instead of talking about analysis of variance, I'm now talking about structural analysis. I'm talking about correlational research. I'm talking about regression. I'm talking about past analysis. So you can see from environment to the stimulus and a long distance remote history to the distal, to proximal. And then that will give you a certain cue, response tendency. And then go up to response and then come out. Achievement and then prediction of behavior in the future. Lou Petrovich thought you need to have two lens in order to account for the complex behavior. In those days, when I was working with him in New I keep asking him about what is this? Central controller. But what is the central controller? You put something there and you don't say anything. It's an empty concept. So I, I fought with him, I argued with him for a long time until nowadays. It's a brain. That's where the brain is. Brain is the controller. So we need to look at the brain. The brain is beautiful. You don't want to look at them in the original form. That's, that's ugly. But that's the brain. And it was in a mosaic in many different ways that we had to put it together to see all these connections, activities. Now, we're going to show you the complex behavior. Next. That's our brain. Okay. Now we're going to get you into one day. See, we can now begin to look at different parts of the brain. Sleeping. Where the sleeping? That's where the in the brain. Those are places that was responsible for the REM sleep. Next, motor. <laughs> Anyway, 
you can see. So you can, in a day, your daily, we can actually walk into the three-dimensional brain and then look at every place. What's going on? Here, there, here, there, they're sleeping. Maybe I can wake you up. Something like this. So, in order to understand this language, a perfect subject to investigate the interaction among the brain, gene, and culture. So you can see, individual learning had to go through cultural transmission, biological evolution, and individual learning, culture are all connected. And you look at the environment, learning biases drive linguistic evolution, like both the language and so on. So you can actually have all this, take this all into account. This is by Christian Shen and Toby. Okay. Then the biologist, the Nobel laureate, Adele, Adele Mann, we're talking about information integration theory in our brain that is kind of a, we have to have integration, differentiation, very complicated. And then suddenly, the important thing is this. We always ask about why language come from? Maybe something like the immersion property. Maybe. And then we have a re-entry theory to account for all these complex, complex theories. Okay? Next. This is the most important thing that I wanted to show you. Talking about complex, just look at this. Men, women, their brain connectivity. See that? When a boy, he started to have all the connections from back and forth. Back and forth, in one hemisphere, within one hemisphere. But for women, it started very young. They all connected from inter-hemisphere. You can see this connections. Women in young, in adolescence, in young adult, and in average, men into each hemisphere connection. Women cross hemisphere connections. Now you know. Because we know look for a long time. Women, they are corpus callosum that connect to cortex, to hemisphere, a thicker, very thick way. The men, for a long time we have no idea what happened. Now we begin to proximally, this is the proximal causation. They are moving back and forth from the very young. And we have no idea whether it's because of it's thicker that pro promote this moving back and forth. Or it's moving back and forth so it's thicker. We have no idea. So we have to go to the dist distal. A distal causation will tell us why. Why men and women had to be different in this way. So we have way of looking at this. Interesting phenomena. So in the language, a lot of things we have to put together. Again, in the Christian Chance and Kirby. You see? Neural correlate, the neuroscience, language acquisition, you have and then they are breakdown. Environmental psychology, neuropsychology, and some of breakdown, language impairment, autism, Williams syndrome, and also Developmental dyslexia. Okay? So, this is a medical school had to cooperate. Language structure, you linguist, psycholinguist, had to work together. Language change, universal. They all just mentioned all this language change. Models, cognitive science, robotic, population biology that we need to have expert coming in. Genetic correlate, gene. And we are doing this too. We are at fin Finland. And in Finland, they have a great data bank on this. And we are comparing different, different sites. Okay? 
Animal communication, how they do it. Do we have, we can trace our behavior into animal. And then fourth off, and then we can endo cast. And then articulatory physiology, all this language evolution, how they evolve. And then the study is, will be conducted in different sites in the studio. We have Peking University, Articulatory Physiology, Hong Jiangping, and Wang Feng. Are they going to be here? Uh, next month. In a month, they will be here. And then we have neuroscience people will bring in. Developmental Psychology, we have uh, Wu Xian, Denise. In a minute, she will talk about working memory, short memory, language structure bill. And so we have PKU, Chan Xi with Hong Kong, PKU, language change universal, and then we have different models. We have people to the field. And we still have looking for people to work on this. And we, we will, because they are bringing people who will be interested in establishing this center together with us. Bill just mentioned when he finished his talk, we really encourage youngsters, you, to think about this is the great adventure of your life. Because we are stepping into something unknown. We have a lot of knowledge, but they all intermix and then not link that world yet. Or some of them we haven't discovered yet. And so we need to put more effort build a better research platform for others. Mm. From gene to cell to a neural system to language disorders, cognition, dyslexia, hearing impairment, and now we are worried about aging and this behavioral side. All these things, your medical school people will help. help. And then we need tools we, of course, we need knowledge. We need facility, we need tools. TMS, eye tracker, ERP, auditory cognition, emotional measurement, and criminal behavior, why we behave badly. And then MRI, MEG, with all these tools here, and most of them in Taiwan. So for those of you who are interested, Remember to look at the advertisement from our center. In the summer, we're going to offer a summer camp in Taiwan from Beijing students from Peking University and other universities, Hong Kong, especially for Chinese University of Hong Kong. Hope you will join us and learn all these different tools, okay? Because you are our hope. Okay, thank you for your attention.